Hi, I'm Claudine and welcome to the second episode of Rabo TV, a new series designed to showcase the very latest in ag innovation. Today, I'm joined by Ben for a market update and Wes to present the Agri Chart of the Week. First up, we're chatting with Rod Campbell, a Western Australian farmer and one of the founders of Swan Systems, an innovative software designed for precision irrigation and fertiliser application. Using the power of technology and data to precisely monitor water and nutrient usage, Swan is helping create enormous water and fertiliser use efficiencies, saving money and reducing environmental impacts. So Rod, having worked practically in agriculture for many years, what was the catalyst for developing Swan Systems? Yeah, look, we all know that farming is challenging at the best of times and added to that complexity of changing weather patterns and water scarcity and this increasing amount of data that's often confusing rather than helping direct decision making. So Swan, as a result, is very much a bottom-up development. So my partners, Tim and Ivor, and myself spent many decades in agriculture, Tim and Ivor and horticulture in Carnarvon, remote part of WA where water scarcity was a real issue. Also working with customers like Rio Tinto had a massive uh, irrigation project in the Pilbara as part of their iron ore mining. So in many ways, it was the lived experience and demanding customers that has created the rigour and accuracy of SWAN. And how does the system actually convert data into practical on-farm action? Look, SWAN is about getting the right mix of water and nutrients. And to do that, we need a lot of different data points. So how much water has been applied, uh, forward weather, things like how much hydration is the plant going to lose over the next seven days, crop type, soil type, phenological stage, all of those things make up the variables that determine scheduling. And one of the key things is we are hardware agnostic. So we take data from lots of different data points. So uh, on-farm devices. So we integrate with over 70 commonly used farm irrigation devices and really enabling the user to leverage significant investments in existing systems and you just overlay our software. So it's really simple. What are the key sustainability outcomes of ensuring the right amount of water is applied to a crop at the right time? Look, running off gut feel invariably results in overwatering and, and work we've done with SA Water showed average overwatering of 30%. So if you're getting that wrong, you're probably also getting your nutritional program wrong and at worst leaching nutrients into the groundwater. So in New Zealand, for example, that's a huge community health issue. And it's this whole thing about social license that we must be smarter about how we use resources. In Australia, think Great Barrier Reef and algal blooms in riverways. So it's also about the carbon footprint. If you're saving water, you're saving pumping costs and whether that's electricity or diesel. And in regards to the crop itself, what are some of the quality and yield improvements you've recorded through increased water and nutrient efficiency? Getting the the right mix of water and nutrients is 80% of a plant's performance. So a vigorous plant is a healthy plant. For a table grape producer, first year of production, we tripled their output and 95% of that was graded A quality. In the wine industry, it's often a trade-off between vigour and quality. So with treasury wines, They're using SWAN to guide at different times. You have to stress the plant to get the right quality outcome. So for them, it's developing an agronomic playbook. And really, as you get years of data and really precise data, you're developing some really powerful corporate IP. For a banana grower, we got the same output level for 30% less water. So that's a huge value return to the uh, operator. We focus on delivering at least a five times return on investment. So as I said, a tripling of yield, when you're looking at gross margins, if you're getting that 80% right water and nutrient, you are so far ahead financially. Congratulations on a fantastic initiative and thanks so much for joining us today. Wonderful, thanks Claudine. Sustainability and profitability is really good for our farmers, it's amazing. Yeah, it sounds really good, Claudine, and I think uh, investors in the United States are interested in this as well. There's a few venture capital funds who are in talks with Swan Systems at the moment. Some really exciting things happening in the ag tech startup space, and now it's time for the uh, market uh, wrap-up. What's happening this week, Ben? Well, Claudine, last week we spoke about bonds and what the market has been signalling in terms of inflation. We're going to delve a little bit deeper into that today and see just why it is that this has become an issue all of a sudden. Viewers at home would be well aware that in 2020, COVID-19 plunged Australia into our first recession since the recession that we had to have all the way back in 1991. 
What was different about the COVID-19 recession is that it was a recession by choice rather than by accident because we had governments literally shutting down businesses and telling people to stay at home. Following the start of the 91 recession, unemployment kept rising for two and a half years and it took nine years to get back to where it had started. By contrast, the unemployment rate from the COVID-19 recession peaked last September and it has been making steady progress ever since. In fact, the recovery from this recession has been so strong that you may have heard reporters calling it a V-shaped recovery. Little wonder when you look at the graph of Australia's GDP over the last year and a bit. GDP growth figures for the December quarter were released last week and showed that at the end of last year, the economy was just 1.1% smaller than it was at the end of 2019. If the pace of growth that we had in the December quarter has extended into the first two months of 2021, the size of the economy has probably already overtaken the pre-COVID-19 highs. So what does all this mean? Basically that the economy is performing far better than the government or the Reserve Bank expected it to. In fact, household incomes data showing a large spike in 2020 suggests that the government may have even overplayed its hand a little bit with the JobKeeper program and the Job Seeker supplement. So Ben, what is 2021 looking like for businesses? Well, Claudine, what seems very likely now is that 2021 will be a bumper year for businesses as vaccines roll out globally and consumers start to spend the record savings that they have squirreled away since the start of the pandemic. Bond traders are betting that as households loosen the purse strings, the economy will boom and cause inflation to heat up, and that may force the RBA to raise rates sooner than they have said. We're also likely to see a good year for commodity prices across the board because global production is low and that boom in demand should drive prices higher. And that's finance. It's been a remarkable turnaround. Thanks, Ben. And now we'll cross over to Wes for a fertiliser update. Thanks, Claudine. Global fertiliser markets have erupted in a Bitcoin-like rally so far this year, taking most in the market by surprise. And local farmers who are currently buying phosphate ahead of the new winter crop season are in the firing line, both from a price and a supply perspective. Through the back half of 2020, global phosphate prices have slowly climbed off 10-year lows, but since mid-January have increased by more than 40%. This is well and truly a demand-led rally, exacerbated by some short-term supply challenges. High grains and all-seeds prices and improved fertiliser affordability have prompted farmers in many key regions to buy up. On the supply side too, a number of factors have contributed to the spike. Most significantly, the US has introduced countervailing duties as high as 47.05% against phosphate fertiliser from Morocco and Russia. Adding fuel to the fire, Phosphate exporters in China, which accounted for 64% of Australia's monoammonium phosphate imports in 2020, have faced rising costs of raw materials and tight domestic supply. Quarter one is typically quieter for international imports than other times of the year, so unexpected high demand has caught some suppliers on the hop with scheduled maintenance impacting production levels. Some global suppliers are now fully booked until April and others unclear on the next available cargo. This all leaves Australian growers, who are mostly reliant on the global market for phosphate supplies, in a precarious position ahead of the new season. We still expect global fertiliser prices to subside mid to late quarter two as the Northern Hemisphere season demand eases, prompting local prices to return to favourable levels soon after. This though may be too late for local growers who begin seeding in April. I referenced Bitcoin earlier, Maybe that was a bit tongue in cheek. In the same time period from 2015, the Bitcoin price has gone from $220 to just over $50,000. Bitcoin prices are astronomical. Do you have any Wes? A little bit volatile for me, Claudine. I'm, I'm happy with my money elsewhere. Thanks, Wes. Thanks very much for having me. And that's all we've got time for today on Rabo TV. Tune in next week as we take a look at the technology set to revolutionise on farm fencing. Turns out you can teach old and young cows new tricks. Follow us on social media for all the updates and we look forward to seeing you then.